So um, I'm glad I'm after Tim because a lot of the things I'm going to talk about are uh, about how things are when they aren't as great as his pipeline showed you. So I'm going to talk about looking at your test results uh, from a more abstract level. So just shortly about me, my name is Lena Viberg, and I am a manager and thought visionary at Lemon Tree. I started out as a developer, turned tester, turned manager, and I love visual models, especially mind maps, but any model, which is actually what brought me into speaking. I also love patterns and trends. I minored in statistic, statistical analysis, uh, and that's what brought me to the topic I'm talking about today. And when I'm not working, I read fantasy or I play games. So this story starts with an awesome new job. <clears throat> and it was framed to me, uh, the main selling point was that I would be allowed to work with continuous improvement in a company that invested a lot in testing, in test automation. Um, they had all of the fancy stuff in place, everyone was aware of the importance of quality, and they had uh, automation in place already. So I thought, awesome, I'm going to make miracles here. So I had a vision walking into this office, and it looked something like this, because this is my view of test automation. So the tests run green. Or we fix them. Sure? You all agree on this? Um, the reality looked more like this. So I would come into my office each morning and I would have a report because no, we didn't have uh, the awesome 30 minutes pipelines, we had nightly runs. And they might be green once every 100 runs or something. And to me, this was a problem, and I was like, yeah, we're going to fix this. Why are these tests so flaky? And people just looked at me and they said, like, what do you mean? They are 95% green. Yeah, but there are always some tests that aren't green. Why aren't we fixing this? And I started talking to people because communication is key, right? And I heard things like, it works fine if I just run them locally. <laughs> or, oh, that's just because the test environment was used by another user. It runs fine if I run them locally. Or something that was particular to my system, uh, we hit a random duality check, so it works fine if I just run them locally. It was just an unexpected pop-up, because we can't handle all of the exceptions, right? It works fine if I just run them locally. Oh, an interacting system had the wrong uh, version or data, or it was down. It works fine if I just run them locally. So, I came to realize, after talking to people, that their reality looked like this. The test would run, they would come to work in the morning, they would have a cup of coffee, because in Sweden we always have a cup of coffee. They would spend maybe a couple of hours of their working days analyzing the test results. Then they would spend another couple of hours fixing them. And then they would prepare everything so it was ready to run the next day, or the next night. So there was absolutely no time for my people to take a step back and think, how can we do this better? 
But as a manager, and as, well, my role was continuous improvement, I had the time. So I thought, well, it's just data. Let's try and identify the problem. So uh, I'm just going to pause there. Part of the data that I collected was, of course, all of this information that I got from talking to people. But I also realized that the data from all of the test runs ever run were still available to me. So I had a colleague uh, write me a script, gathering all the data and put it into the format of managers, Microsoft Excel, which meant that I could look at the data uh, during a five-year period and see if I could find out what was wrong. So, of course, some of the things that I found obvious. For example, we had a number of test cases that had never passed in five years. They were still running every night, failing, and no one was doing anything about it. And of course, this just creates a lot of noise. That is unnecessary. But people are terrified of deleting tests. So, of course, uh, they weren't happy when I told them you fix them or you throw them out. But they did, and we got rid of at least those. But then I also found another thing that I thought was weird. This is moving on its own, it's really scary. Uh, I found a bunch of test cases that had never failed in five years. And I was like, what, why? And does anyone else see this as a problem? No one else at my company thought this was a problem because this was increasing the metrics, right? So management was happy. But I was like, are they checking the right things? Are we never changing anything in that code? Um, what are they doing? And as I said, we didn't have a 30 minute uh, text, test execution. We had more like, okay, um, don't kill me for this. We had more like eight, nine, 10 hours. So running tests that didn't give us value was just a waste of resource that we could use for something else. And I also realized something else along the line, and that was that we were trying to fix multiple problems with the same solution. We were trying to give feedback. So the developers, of course, want fast feedback. Did my check-ins break anything? And then we wanted information about stability. So mainly testers thinking, uh, is this version stable enough, enough for me to even bother exploring it? And then we were using the test results for um, planning. So product owners, scrum masters, or the team were uh, using the test results as a way of knowing, is this version stable enough for release? And also as a way of making sure we were investing money in the right places. So of course, for me as a manager, I wanted to see that we were improving so that we had um, increased stability, increased coverage, uh, reduced test execution time, all of the things that I wanted to know. Um, am, I, am I putting my money where it's bringing me the most value? So for me, those green tests were really important. But to a developer who wanted feedback on his code, it might be just fine that they were red, because then he could fix the problems and check them in. So by looking at the data, and also the data that I actually got from talking to people, and doing some root analysis, I found uh, a number of areas where um, people thought that they couldn't improve the tests. 
And I'm just going to talk about a few of those groups. So the first one is related to operations and hardware. And in this area, uh, I had issues like firewalls that didn't allow us to do tests in a way that we wanted. Or uh, the tests were failing because we were doing backups at that time. Or tests tended to fail every, say, third Thursday of a month because the operations team were doing patches at that time. And since we weren't at a place where we were a proper DevOps team because the operations were still at another floor and the de development was sitting on the seventh floor and the operations on the ground floor, uh, they didn't communicate as they could have, which meant that the development team thought that the tests were failing just randomly once every month. And they never bothered to look at the fact that it was the same date. But once you looked at it, it was obvious that we could just make them run 30 minutes earlier or an hour later, and they wouldn't hit the backups, they wouldn't hit the patches. And of course, if you just talk to operations, they are mainly people. And they will help you if you just tell them what you need. The biggest of the groups, I would say, are related to test environments and test data issues. So, for example, we had issues with test data being eaten up by other tests. Or uh, the environment was not in a state that we wanted it to be because someone else was running tests at the same time. Or, as I said, a service was down or had the wrong data or the wrong version. And I noticed that the development teams thought that they couldn't fix this because they didn't know how to work with test data. They didn't know how to uh, mock services. They thought that the easiest thing to do is to just test from start to finish through all of the layers because the service is there, right? Why should I spend time writing a mock-up when the service is there? If I just run it through the service, I will test the interaction at the same time. Awesome, right? But it also meant that the tastes were unnecessarily flaky. So a lot of this can be improved by um, synthesizing test data or, um, again, operations could probably give you more test environments if you ask them. So you could spin up uh, test environments just to run your tests in so you won't break team B and their test runs. And of course, mocking. I'm a big fan of mocking and uh, I had to fight a lot for that. And then you just test the interaction when you, are, uh, when you actually want to test the interaction. Again, Tim talked about culture. Uh, process and communication was a big issue for us. I heard people say, we didn't know that the code has changed. And that, to me, is a true horror story. We have teams sitting on the same floor next to each other, and they don't know what the other teams are doing. I also heard a lot of, we didn't have time to update it. Probably because they were stuck in the hamster wheel and they were just fixing the test results instead of focusing on actually improving them. And also, this is kind of interesting because do you have like uh, critical patches coming in, breaking the normal development routine? We couldn't test that because the tests could only be run against one version of the system. Because it wasn't version handled along with the production code. 
And all of these come from people not actually talking to each other. So ideas to improve process and communication is of course, again, having tests included from the start and not just in the start and the end, but through the entire chain. Um, talking to each other over different teams if you can't encapsulate your tests enough. Um, have someone from teams that might be interested in your code changes invited to your stand-ups or just send them an email saying, this is what we will be changing this sprint. Or you can work with uh, Three Amigos principle, having someone from business, test, development uh, included in every change. And in that way, you will always know. Oh my God. I don't know why this is changing automatically. It's really scary. Um, have everyone included in the room, so you will always know what's up. Or, of course, pair programming, mobbing, um, disable tests that you know won't pass, encapsulate stuff. These are the problems that are hardest to fix because culture is it's really ingrained in us and we will struggle as humans to change culture and processes. But eventually this actually happened. You found a bug, which is... Awesome. Your tests did what they should, and then you fix it. So, to sum it all up, don't try to, uh, or try not to get too caught up with the daily routine. Try to step, take a step back and try to look past the obvious. Those perfect tests that never fail. Are they really bringing you value, or are they actually a cost? So convery them. If they don't spark joy, get rid of them. And even things that look like they can't be fixed probably can. You just find the right person to talk to. And of course, Object orienting and reusing is awesome, except when it's not. So don't try to solve multiple problems with the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, of course. First question uh, comes soon, but uh, please prepare now uh, lots of questions because we have uh, approximately 15 minutes for questions. So there is quite a good chance that we can use uh, question assurance this time. <laughs> Raymond. Okay, thank you for the talk and this is very interesting to me because I'm trying to find ways to uh, use this results in more ways than just pass and fail. So how did you see that if you fix the tests, did you see any changes in a way that the assertions were done? Sorry, the way did that... Did you see the way that uh, the assertions were done? What was asserted? What was the verification step? Did, was there any changes about how the tests were structured and how they were validating the results? Did you see any changes in, in that pattern way or was uh, it case by case? Yeah, definitely. Um, as I said, this, the role was sold to me as we have this autom awesome automation in place and you will just have to show, in, show up and drink coffee. Uh, but in reality, we had to like, tear everything down and build it up again because we were doing these massive end-to-end -end things, asserting a million things. So the biggest part was actually convincing people with this data that we needed to do something. Because, so they, yes, the assertions had to be totally rewritten. Oh, yes, we have. Harlas, you go first. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. So I was wondering how you got around the problem where you mentioned that um, when the uh, infrastructure team were, were doing patches, so did you have some sort of uh, 
scheduled tests that were run after each commit or or hour on an hourly base. So how when when they want to do suddenly patches, so do you have some sort of automated mechanism in place that would stop these tests from running or or worst what is just a manual thing of them telling you, hey, don't run any tests now? Well, in our case, we knew when the patches would be um, applied. So then we could easily schedule them. But bringing the operations team into the development teams were a big part of it, because then they could actually give me the solution, because they would say, well, oh, we have a scheduling tool for this, or, oh, we could just move the patches to another time, which suits you better. Um, but how, how did they know, were they aware then, like when you have a like CI system which does things like upon every commit or upon like every night, so did, were they just then aware that okay there were no commits during that last hour so now we can do our, our um, patches that no test, tests will be automatically scheduled to run or you didn't have such No, systems? we did it the other way around. We scheduled test automation around the patches because the patches were uh, more uh, mandatory. Okay, oh, okay. I understand now, yeah. So you, you, you kind of knew where there were no tests being run and then... Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so really awesome talk that I feel like a lot of us have dealt with. How did your team actually react to it in the end of changing their mindset from, you know, just fix it in the day and then move on to actually having to do the work to fix these things long term? Um, depends on the team, I would say. Uh, some teams were happy just given the data and they were like, oh, awesome, now we know how to fix. And some are still struggling. Um, but I found that a big shift of mindset came with me actually standing on the stage in front of the entire IT department just talking about uh, these are the kinds of analysis you can do and this is what you could look for. Uh, and I mean, no one at the entire division had ever thought about the fact that perfect tests could be a problem. Cool, thanks. Hi. Besides the good status of uh, test automation, I saw some many times actually, there's also a need to, me to measure the efficacy of uh, test automation because sometimes automation runs in parallel to the manual testing and activities of manual testers. So do you measure somehow how uh, the test automation for the company is being, uh, uh, prov providing value? Um, we could measure the, um, that we increase the coverage and that we reduce the manual, uh, or rather that the manu manual testers could do more exploration and less scripts. Um, and we could also see that the execution time went down. That's basically what we had time to measure. Um, but but it is in fact, the automation is bringing the benefit of detecting the effects before eventually the manual process or other processes are uh, tracking them. Is there, because yes, for example, I monitor the coverage, the coverage is going fine, uh, average success rate is uh, within the range where it's not passing consistently or failing consistently. But then, how much is actually tracked by uh, automation? It's, it's uh, down to the process of communication, in this case, between who's monitoring automation and who's uh, reporting issues uh, through other uh, means. Yeah, um, at another company, we measured um, amount of bugs found where in the chain, which was a good measurement for that team. But at this company, the issue was more uh, freeing time to add more tests, more coverage, uh, because we were covering a small part of the system with uh, in like way, way, way too long of an execution time. So you would have to tailor what you measure for what's, whatever brings most value for your business. So that was not something we looked for at, at this company. Thank you. Uh, hello, thank you for the talk. And the question is, if you can go back, back to the start, what can you change to avoid these issues in the first place? Well, I guess first one is to build the right culture, but what else? 
Sorry, could you do? Could uh, if you can go back to the start of the project uh, of this whole scene, what can be done to avoid issues you get? Um, well, the the biggest part is bringing everyone into the same room. So Having it's them talk. most about culture, uh, it's about talking to each other. If you stop communication and culture, a lot of the other stuff will fix itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Alex uh, Fitbit. So you said that uh, tests were failing for five years and nobody paid attention to this and it uh, just uh, terrified me how this could happen. Yep, and me too. And probably uh, all that uh, problems you had, it's not about the culture, but about uh, uh, the team uh, which was not experienced or could not uh, do their job well because uh, reviewing test results is uh, the first thing to do after a test fails. Yeah. Um, Maybe you just needed uh, a new team of professionals. Um, I'm from Sweden, so that's not really easy to do. We can't get rid of people easily, uh, but we can educate them, of course. Um, I would say that in this case, it was a big part of culture because they they honestly had the view that if the tests will pass when I run them locally. The, it's not an issue with the tests, so it would be cheaper just to rerun them. So it was a big culture change to actually have them have the guts to throw something out. Because at the same time, they were measured at number of test cases, of course. So if they would remove test cases, management would ask why. So. It was a culture problem both in the teams, but also in management, that they were measuring the wrong things. Hello. Uh, we are kind of about to make a culture change, I believe. And you have data of, for five years about what, how the tests were running and what failed and what didn't fail. Um, and we don't have that statistics. What, how did you make that statistics, first of all? And what we do is we try to fix it, like in the morning, and uh, I hear some murmurs like this are flaky tests, and I know uh, when we have the service window, things fail. So, but I would like to have some statistics to show and bring it up to the management so that we can talk about a culture change. I see problems, but I don't know how to, how did you? Are you uh, sure you don't have the data? Uh, or I don't know how to, because <laughs> um, <laughs> like that was the first problem. People thought we didn't have the data, but it, it was right there. It was in, we were using TFS, so all of the results were just saved in a folder somewhere, which should have been cleared at some point, but it wasn't. Um, I had it in my Outlook folder because I was sent the emails every day. Oh, okay. um, I'm guessing you have the data somewhere. Mm -hmm. You just have to find it. Yeah, now I got some answers, yeah. like Outlook <laughs> folders and yeah, thank you. About tests that are always green, like how do you decide that you should throw them away? Maybe they're green because the functionality was like never touched, but tomorrow they could be a big refactoring and this could be broken. And if you uh, uh, disable them, how do you know? Uh, how do you know it's not broken? Um, in my case, all of the tests were tagged, so. And in my case, it was with a certain functionality or area of the system. And since we know what we are checking in, we could easily check if we needed to disable or enable the tests, um, which could be automatic if you had that pipeline. But I mean, it's, it's, you don't have to throw them away. You could just turn them off and then turn them on. Or it's not a problem and you just run them. So you're talking about like dividing the pack into small uh, packs and running them depending on what you've changed. Yeah. Or yeah, if thanks. you if you are just patching this small little thing, why are you testing all yeah, of this? Yeah, makes sense. 
Um, one, how to tackle cultural change in big companies and big uh, fast growing companies? So currently I have a problem where I'm running through, we have a bigger community of practice and uh, I'm boring people out on community of practice, I'm bo boring people out in person, I'm boring people out on pull requests uh, and I'm getting more and more and more tired. And also uh, now when I enter some team space, uh, people look at me like a big bad wolf and I'm trying to be nice and I'm trying to uh, do everything correctly. So how to tackle this problem in, uh, fast growing companies and uh, cultural problem because um, that is something uh, I cannot fix on my own, right? Um, I don't know if my answer will match for a fast growing company. I don't think I've ever worked for a fast growing company. I kind of get in um, um, old, large, tired organizations. But I would say the key is to find what will actually sell it to them. So for me, it was um, making it possible to have um, runs every check-in so the developers would actually get the feedback they wanted. Once I realized that that was the pain point, it was easy to just sell that. Or for management, it was if we just do this, uh, we will not have that angry customer call in asking why he suddenly didn't get the money he was supposed to get because we had broken something. Or um, at another company, the um, key to getting the money was just decreasing execution time. So try to find the ones that have some sort of unofficial leadership status and see what's important to them. Thanks. And now the last question. And what about positive force? For example, your suit is 95% successful, but 5% are failing. But failing due to linked issues in Jira, which are not fixed. Should we run each day or we can't uh, kill them because we're indicating the existing problem, but due to prioritization, they're not being f fixed. What you can suggest? What can you suggest in this situation? So what's the question test that you know will fail because you have something that's not fixed? Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's not flaky, it's not, not stable, it's stable, but it, sh it shows the existing problem. Um, I personally would turn them off because they would only be noise to me. Uh, we, I couldn't get the teams to agree to that, so they marked them in some way as, so they were the orange in the reality. So this is an issue, we know it's an issue, so it's not screaming red, uh, but it's still not green. Um, but I personally would just turn them off until you know they will run green. Or at least they should run green. Okay, thank you. And thank you all for the questions. You make a, make a big applause for yourselves also. <clears throat> and thank you, Lena. <laughs> thank you.